It's time for a frightening festive feature in a special Christmas edition of Nightmare Fuel. Throughout the 1970s and then revived in the mid-2000s, the BBC aired a chilling original short film on Christmas Eve in the series known as A Ghost Story for Christmas. Intended to send viewers to bed with a frown rather than a smile, this series was hugely popular and has a cult following. However, in my Nightmare Fuel today, I'm going to take it back to the film that, despite originally airing in May, inspired the Ghost Story for Christmas series in the first place. It's time to talk about one of the most celebrated ghost stories of all time, Whistle and I'll Come to You. This 1968 adaptation of the M.R. James story, or Whistle and I'll Come to You, My Lad, was broadcast as a part of the BBC featurette Omnibus, which ran for nearly 40 years and was mostly themed around documentaries. So imagine how people must have reacted when they were presented with this spook fest. Let's get into it. Our opening narration here sets a creepy tone with a bit of background info on M.R. James himself, along with the original Whistle story. It gives us an indication of the main theme we are about to be presented with, when a scholar is presented with something unbelievable and questions it, yet is given a look into something mind-changing in startling fashion. The scholar the scholar in question here is one Professor Parkin, who is taking a break from academia with a seaside holiday. He's played immensely by Michael Hordern. Not a single scene feels acted. He's extremely natural, quite fussy and a fidgety person in general, and just his line delivery is like it's jumping right out of his brain rather than being recited. He makes the entire tale so much more believable. Parkin is a man who enjoys solitude, often keeping his distance from other guests in the hotel, rarely engaging with them. And boy does he eat. Most of the film he's just scoffing his face. It became so excessive that I actually found it pretty funny. Anyway, the hotel is on the east coast of England, nearby the open country, sand dunes and a beach, and Parkin decides to spend his holiday exploring the landscape. He wanders alone, accompanied by a walking stick and a packed lunch, and you can sense the isolation here with Jonathan Miller's direction. Seemingly, Parkin is the only living soul for miles around. Keyword, living. That's because the dunes are attached to a cemetery, and Parkin comes across a gravestone on the side of a cliff. Reaching over the mound, he is able to retrieve a mucky object. Find us keepers. However, as he continues his stroll, for the first time we see someone else in the area, a shadowy figure in the distance, standing statutory, gazing at Parkin from afar. This is our first indication that something isn't quite right and is eerily framed on screen. Simple yet effective, something which carries on throughout the film. Taking the object back to the hotel and cleaning it up, Parkin realises that it's a whistle. He blows into it and, much like the title suggests, there's a sense that something starts coming to him. He doesn't quite know what, but immediately after blowing into it, Parkin can hear the winds and the oceanic gushes of the seaside from where he claimed it, along with once again glimpsing at the mysterious shape lurking on the horizon. The figure continues to be seen, at least I think it does. There's this one shot where Parkin goes back onto the dunes, and in the very far distance I can make out a black shape. I'm not certain if this is intended to be the same figure or something else. The framing of the shot tells me it is the figure, but either way, it played on my mind, so the film really did have an impact on my suspicions towards the threat here. Back at the hotel, Parkin converses with another guest, a colonel played by Ambrose Coghill, during breakfast regarding ghosts and death. In a brilliantly scripted scene, the two chat about the concept of the human personality surviving beyond death, with Parkin bringing philosophy into the equation that the phrase surviving death wouldn't be the right way of framing it, as you wouldn't say it in the same way as, for example, surviving a train crash. And he just sits and linguistically breaks down terminology relating to death and injury, overall coming to a conclusion that death is very much in its own category, the ultimate state of permanence. However, that whistle proves to be a thorn in his academic crown that may very well change his perspective forever. In his hotel room, 
car can hear strange noises and then one night has a nightmare, which is my main source of nightmare feel from this film. He keeps on getting startled into being semi-awake before drifting back off to sleep again and the nightmare continuing, as though it's inescapable. What we witness is Parkin on the beach running at full speed. It's as though he's being pursued. You can see the fear-filled expression on his face that he is petrified in this moment, yet we aren't aware of what he's running from. The soundtrack is this constant whomping sound, like a heartbeat, almost alien in design, along with occasional loud piercing noises. <laughs> After continuing to run away, we eventually see what it is that's been hunting him. Something that appears to be a large piece of cloth or fabric floating in the distance, drifting across the beach, before a final sharp noise to return Parkin to the waking world. This entire segment is masterfully crafted. There's little to no complication in its design, hardly any money required to create it. It's all done with the performance by Hordern being strong, the sound design being exquisite, and a ragged cloth suspended on a wire. Simple as that. Yet for 1968, and still to this day, this entire segment provides something deeply unsettling to the table, a true sense of unease. Parkin continues to show signs of disbelief and dismay, especially when one morning, despite having two beds in his room and only sleeping in one, both beds have been rumpled, as though they have both been slept in. The only people with keys to the room are Parkin himself, the maid, and the hotel proprietress, so why do both beds Beds appear slept in. We find out the answer in the film's haunting climax. While in bed, Parkin begins to hear ruffling noises, the sound of fabric being moved and scrumpled. He peeks across to the other bed, when the sheets begin to rise and form a reaper-like shape, the same as on the beach. The film's frame rate choppily slows, adding disorientation to the scene, similar to the first appearance of the cloth figure on the beach. Parkin is frozen to the spot, muttering incoherently as the figure continues to form. The colonel enters the room having heard Parkin's panicking and the sheet returns to normal. As a shell-shocked Parkin continuously says the words, oh no, before the film suddenly yet impactfully ends on his awestruck expression. Now that's a climax. What Whistle and I'll Come To You does so effectively is it takes a super simple premise and injects it with pure atmosphere. A lot of modern viewers may find it boring or slow and it is certainly a slow burner, even for a film as short as 41 minutes, but it plays that length to its advantage. It's the kind of film that thrives on what you don't see, allowing your own imagination to fill in the gaps, while providing a mysterious philosophical debate at its core. Mark Dugwood of the British Film Institute once described Whistle as a masterpiece of economical horror, and I completely understand his meaning here. It's cost effective in the sense that it's mostly a man in a hotel and and going on some walks. There's nothing overly complex about it, yet it is still able to chill you and get under your skin by understanding and exploiting its strengths. Whistle and I'll Come To You remains a cult British classic, with a modern adaptation also by the BBC released in 2010. This version was written by Luther creator Neil Cross and starred the late great John Hurt as Parkin. Some changes were made to the 1968 version, with Hurt playing a retired astronomer astronomer rather than a Cambridge professor, and has came on holiday to have a respite break from his wife's advanced dementia. The whistle in this version is now a wedding ring, though I suppose ring and I'll come to you might have made viewers think he was going to find a Nokia or something. Those things could easily survive a bit of longshore drift. But anyway, there we go, that's my reasoning as to why whistle and I'll come to you earns its spot on our Nightmare Fuel Hall of Fame. Not only is it creepy in its own right, but the fact it inspired an entire series of ghost story adaptations just gives it that extra VIF quality. That's very important fuel if you're wondering. If you enjoyed this video, a cheeky sub would be much appreciated to help the channel grow. I've been Connor from Unleash the Ghouls, and we shall see you next time for another dose of Nightmare Fuel.